Community Connections and What's Up Doc. Dr. Seville, we're going to have those questions from Largo Middle and Largo High School students. Yep. Ashante, do you have a question for Dr. Seville? Um, why do we have to get flu shots every year? Well, Ashante, I want to thank you very much for participating in this wonderful event, which we're going to have every month in the future. And that's a wonderful question. People ask me that every day. But let's start off with a very important statistic. Last year in the United States alone, 78,000 people died of the flu and flu-related illnesses. Now, if everyone on our planet, but especially in this country, got the flu vaccine, that number would not be zero, of course, but it would be much, much lower. So what I want to tell you, Ashante, is that the first reason to get a flu shot, of course, is because I want you to be healthy. But the truth is, in people your age who are unlikely to get very sick from the flu, by getting the flu shot, you are saying, I care about my fellow man, I care about other people. And what I mean is, when you get the flu shot, you therefore don't get a low-grade illness one day and end up going to the local grocery store or coming to school and come into contact with somebody whose immune system may be compromised. Maybe there's people in your school who have cancer and they're being treated with chemotherapy or a fresh newborn baby or an elderly person whose immune system isn't what it used to be because of age. And they get the flu from you and they end up dying of that illness just because of their contact with somebody who had a low grade illness. Jacquez, do you have a question for Dr. Seville? I've been playing football since I was seven. What are the chances of me having long lasting health issues? Jacquez, how nice of you to bring up this topic because it's so very important and we think about it every Saturday we watch college football and Sunday we watch professional football. And sometimes we forget about the cumulative effect of CTE or brain injuries that happened when somebody was seven years old or when they were playing football older than that and certainly in high school. It is a very complicated issue and I'm not gonna sit here today and tell you that you should not play football because I don't think that's an answer you wanna hear. I hope that technology catches up with the problems at hand meaning that we develop better helmets, just like we found airbags in cars, and better ways to protect our knees and ankles. Some parts of our body can heal, other parts don't. And so I know that you're speaking specifically about brain injuries, and every time your bell has been rung, or every time there's helmet to helmet, or helmet to knee contact, that's unavoidable. What happens to you? Well, I wanna make sure, of course, that your coaches are telling you all the time about keeping your head up, and talking about safety on and off the field, which we know starts with hydration, not people who decide they're finally gonna drink some water 10 minutes before a game or a practice, which I know you don't, because you've learned that all of your sporting life. But safety starts with preparation, and preparation has to do with hydration, having to do with the best equipment that you can have on the football field, and always trying to be alert when you are out there and paying attention to what is going on. The truth of the matter is, we can't prepare for everything, whether it be Las Vegas or a car accident you don't expect, or even slipping and falling and hitting your head in the hallway of a school or in the aisle of a grocery store because there was water on the ground. But when you pay attention to what's going on in the football field, you can prevent yourself from becoming injured more often than not. But the truth of the matter is, I hope you will always wear the best helmet. You'll always pay attention to what your great coaches are telling you and that you will promise me one other thing. Too often people, not just in the professional or college ranks, but in high school, get injured. And they don't say anything to a coach because they know that coach is going to sit them down. And that there's somebody else nipping at their heels, trying to take their job, trying to take their place on the field. And I hope you'll understand that when you feel that you've been injured, that you will immediately talk to your coach or the trainers, the assistant staff, and sit down. Even if it costs your team the game or your part on that field, in the next game. Let me tell you something I saw on TV just last week. It was a routine hit with a player being tackled, head versus head, right at the goal line, and no one said anything about it. Now, no one did anything on purpose, and the players got up after that, but it was quite a violent collision of an offensive and a defensive player, and that happens on almost every play. Where do we draw the line in professional football or college football or in high school football? I really don't know. But promise me that you'll help your fellow man on that football field, even on the opposing side. How often have you seen somebody on the other side who looks like they might need medical attention, but you think, you know what, I'll just run around them. 
But the right thing to do, of course, is to make sure they get the help they need as well. So I really appreciate, Jacques, your question. And I hope that you'll start that dialogue in the classroom and in the locker room so that all of us can stay healthier. And promise me that if you feel you've been injured, that you make sure you let somebody know and you sit down because you have a wonderful life in front of you and I want you to have every day that life has to offer. Thank you so much again. Amber, do you have any questions for Dr. Seville? Yes, I do. As a high school student preparing for college, what immunization should I be concerned about? Amber, that's another great question. I can't thank you enough for again participating in this wonderful event. I want to make sure that you're the kind of person who comes from a family where all the checkups have been done. We know we start seeing people when they're a month of age and two months and four months. And we know that if you go to a checkup every year of your life after you are two years of age, there should never be a problem with the immunizations you need to go to college because they will have been offered when they should be offered by law and by common sense. But there are certain vaccines that are very important that you want to know about in college because it's a communal living situation. People live in a dorm or apartment. You sit in classrooms with hundreds of people. And if one person is sick, oftentimes people can become sick just from that exposure. Also, we make bad decisions in college. Sometimes we don't eat properly or there is alcohol involved even before the age of 21. And people make decisions they might not otherwise make, putting their lives at risk. First of all, you should be current on all immunizations before you go to college, including your tetanus vaccine. You never know when you could cut yourself in a lab or outside, things that your mommies and daddies used to remind you about. But now that you're living on your own, you're responsible for that as well. The meningitis vaccine, Menactra, and the second one, Trumenba. These are vaccines which you should have so you don't get a brain infection. The kind of infection you can breathe in through the air conditioning system of even the cleanest of dorms in the newest of colleges and find yourself with a headache, vomiting, and death in 24 hours of time or less. And so you want to make sure you have those vaccines. But let's talk about Gardasil. That seems to be the controversial vaccine. Probably a lot of you have had of it. Had it sometimes the parents don't want that vaccine. Gardasil is that vaccine we get to prevent human papillomavirus. That's the virus that can affect our genitals or our mouth that can be spread sexually but we have kids getting that virus when they are just 10 or 11 years of age because they drink out of somebody else's beverage. There was a recent case in this town of several gentlemen on a Little League team who ran out of water and drank out of one of those boys' older brother's cup who had HPV in the mouth, and all of those kids got HPV. Because there were seven of them, two of them, out of statistics, will probably get cancer. And one of those kids might die before he's 14 years old. And those kids were too young to get Gardasil in this country. My point is that this is a real public health crisis that has very little to do with sexual activity. It is estimated that next year, three times more people in our country will get HPV from drinking out of something or kissing somebody or having some non-sexual oral issue than will get that from the sexual contact issue we normally think of. So I hope you've had your Gardasil vaccine already, but if not, we'll get it, which will keep you from potentially getting human papillomavirus, which could lead to cancer and death. Will, do you have a question for Dr. Seville? Yes, how much sleep should a child get every night? Will, that's a great question. And I think maybe you're asking it because you've had an argument with your parents <laughs> about when you should go to bed, especially in middle school in our community, where people go to school later and therefore expect to stay up later. We have kind of skewed hours. The truth of the matter is people need sleep to be able to function the next day. But if I gave you an exact number, that would be inappropriate because all of us are different. I remember uh, when I was a young man and I'm 55 and I'm lucky to have my dad with me and he's 87. But my knowledge of my existence at your age was the sound of a shuffling of cards in the middle of the night because we had lived in a small home and my dad couldn't sleep at night and he played solitaire. There were no video games and there were no handheld devices in those days, but he played solitaire, a hundred or more games every night. And he probably slept four and a half hours. And one of the great things I've gotten from my father, besides I hope my intellect and uh, my sense of humor, is my love of other people, is my inability to sleep as many hours as I would like. And I probably sleep five hours a night. The experts will tell you that's not the best thing for you, but it's either that or rolling around in bed and having my wife yell at me because <laughs> she can't get asleep. So my point is that I want you to get all the sleep you can, but it has to do with the subject, two words, sleep hygiene. 
And that, that means it's having clean sleep, being able to put yourself in the right place and frame of mind to get to bed. And what are the things that we all do at night? Well, we find ourselves in our connected devices, don't we? Maybe you watched a movie that made you think too much right before you went to bed. Or you want to get in that last text message or read the last email or play that last video game. And we know that's the wrong thing to do. I know experts tell you we want to shut our brains down for the hour that precedes rolling off to bed. But sometimes it is impossible because you have six or seven classes, you have nine projects due tomorrow, and you know that you have to work on your homework right before you brush your teeth and go off to bed. So life gets in the way sometimes, doesn't it? So my point in telling you that is that quality of sleep is often better than quantity. So five good hours with your brain shut down sleeping is better than lying in bed eight hours where you believe you fall asleep at two or three o'clock in the morning and then wake up in a timely fashion to go to school. Sometimes people use yoga or other breathing techniques and there are many of them found in wonderful online reputable sites. So I want you to think about the subject of sleep hygiene and understanding how you can become a better sleeper and not worry just about, about the time you'll be sleeping, but the quality of sleep when you are at rest. But also having that dialogue at home. Sometimes we have a lot of things in our mind when we go to bed, and I'm a big fan of family dinners. Sometimes they can't take place. People have sporting events or other outside activities, gymnastics and what it might be. And of course, some moms and dads are working hard to put food on the table and aren't in the home when there is time for dinner. But my point in asking that point and talking is I want you to be able to tell people what's on your mind before you go to bed. Sometimes unloading yourself of those things which are bothering you can give you the peace of mind you need to get better sleep. So have a family conversation. It's a healthy thing to do for everybody. It keeps people connected and it might help you get that better night's sleep, Will. Jonathan, do you have a question for Dr. Seville? What are the signs of heat exhaustion? Jonathan, what a wonderful question to ask, and I appreciate it very much. You know, we've talked about in the past football and injuries with head injuries and what goes on, but heat exhaustion is a very important topic. And I'm sure this comes up because perhaps you're involved in some sports team or doing some other outdoor activity. But people learned a lot about heat exhaustion recently when Irma came to visit and left us without power in most places and homes that were 90 degrees and left us with the need to clean up our own yards and our communities when Irma was gone and we were outside working in the heat with very little respite because there was no power and no air conditioning. It's very important to understand heat exhaustion and it's one of the reasons why I ask kids every day in my office, do you have to urinate while at school? And they always give me a funny look as, suppose you, as I suppose you did just now. But by knowing that kids have to urinate during the day tells me they're drinking enough. And the truth is, in this day and age, people should only drink water. People don't really need sports beverages. They don't need dairy products. That's another topic for another time. But the truth is that you should drink water and enough water during the day that you have to go to the bathroom at least once because that means you are functioning at a normal level. And people need to be aware of that. And sometimes parents send their kids to school with a 16 ounce bottle of water and no one ever goes to the water fountain because there's a line, but you really need a half a gallon of water a day at your age, just in school itself. So why I'm telling you that is that you should understand the notion of low level heat exhaustion, that which precedes the time when you're standing outside, you're delirious, you can't concentrate, your eyes start rolling back in your head, you're seeing stars, and the next thing you know, you're in the nurse's office and somebody has a cold face cloth on your head. The truth is you could have borderline dehydration all day long because you're not drinking enough. You find yourself unable to concentrate in the classrooms, distracted even more than you would usually be. Or you feel yourself being very cold or very warm when the atmosphere in your classroom doesn't warrant that. So what I'd like you to think about is the signs of exhaustion is first your lack of ability to concentrate. All of a sudden you don't know where you are or you can't put your head down and do the work that you need to do, whether it be in the classroom or you are outside participating in some kind of a sporting event where this might happen. Of course, if you were drinking enough to prepare yourself for that event, hopefully that wouldn't happen. When a football player plays a game on Friday night, he knows that he has to start drinking the day before. This applies to girls and boys, of course. But when you feel yourself having a lack of concentration, and perhaps you're feeling lightheaded, as it were, or you feel yourself getting warm or cold or tingling in your fingers or your feet, 
that is the time that you should not only leave whatever you are doing safely, get into air conditioning and start drinking water, but alert, to so alert somebody that you feel that way. I don't want you going into a room that's cool by yourself and lying down on a couch and somebody finds you passed out an hour later and you need to be in the hospital for IV fluids. I want you to let somebody know, hey, this is the way I'm feeling. Dr. Greg told me during the question and answers, this is a sign of heat exhaustion or dehydration. I might be having a heat stroke. It's time for them to help you, whether or not they're going to get you water or maybe in the worst case scenario, calling an ambulance because you might need emergent IV hydration that's not available where you are. So that's a wonderful question. And I hope that you will, again, start a dialogue in your classroom about these issues. And I hope that you will make sure those on your team, if that's why we're asking this question, and those on the opposing team will be safe, that you will hydrate yourself, you'll talk about it with your family and your fellow teammates, and also realize that you don't have to be out in the heat to have heat exhaustion or to become dehydrated to the point of needing medical attention. I hope that you'll think about those things and keep yourself safe. And thanks again for taking part in this wonderful question and answer session. And I want to thank Lori also for being here and asking me to come and speak to the folks of our wonderful county. And I look forward to joining you again soon. Well, I appreciate it, Dr. Seville, and, and we thank you. Again, I always learn something when you come in. So thank you for being here. When we come back, we're going to talk about healthy eating.